going Inawood this weekend. Need some green texts and Inawood stories. Be me 8 or 9. Go to Kingston with family for vacation. Dad goes into old bookstore go with him. The whole store is a long narrow hallway. At end of the hallway is a staircase. Go upstairs and it's more of an actual room. Tons of bookshelves making rows. They reach to the ceiling and so crammed with books they are basically falling out. So many books that it soundproofs the upstairs. I can basically hear my heart beat. Dad is looking the horror section and we can hear someone in the next row looking thought books. Didn't see anyone else come up and there was no noise other than us for a couple minutes. Little kid me is spooked. Generic ghost shit.png. Rooms gets cold. A pile of books not too far from us falls over. Dad is now spooked too but is still looking as we slowly make our way out. Then books start falling off the shelves. Noped out of there so fast my dad almost left me. As we run out clerk smiles and says have a good day as if he knew exactly what happened. Mom is super into slash x slash it so we go on haunted walk that night. Stop in front of bookstore. Tell story about how it was an orphanage that burned down with a bunch of children or something like that. To this day they enjoy playing around and scaring people more fun in the upstairs where the beds were. Dad and I both look at each other as we shit ourselves. When I and my wife were quite a bit younger, we decided that we would spend the bicentennial outdoors. Yes, July of 76. We're old. We lived in Pueblo at the time, and decided to go hiking, fishing and camp along Lime Creek between Durango and Silverton. There wasn't anything other than brookies in the creek, but they were plentiful and fun to catch. We left our car by the side of the road along Old Lime Creek Road about 5 miles in from the highway and packed in upstream along the creek with our shepherd, Rebel. It only took us about an hour to get to where we wanted to camp, a nice meadow beside the creek just before a slot canyon that required you to swim to get any further upstream. Either that or take a several mile detour. We camped uneventfully that night, the 3rd of July, enjoying the sounds of the rippling creek and nature all around us. It was such a nice night that we just slept out under the stars, didn't bother to pitch our little backpacking tent. A little cool, but we had the fire going in our lightweight 30 degree bags, so we were very comfortable. The next day we had breakfast, packed up and we all swam our way up the creek to the next wide spot with a bit of bank in the canyon, only about 150 yards or so. Now Rebel was never one to turn down a chance to get wet, but we had to do quite a bit of coaxing to get him to follow us up the creek. We fished and splashed upstream a bit, and before we knew it it was lunchtime. We thought we'd fry up some of those brookies but we were in this slot canyon that terminated in a fairly deep pool with about a 10-foot rocky waterfall at the end of it. We decided that I would scale the waterfall and pull the dog and the packs up and then I'd help Maggie get up. It was fairly difficult, even with the help of an old cable left over from a mining operation that was hanging down the side wall of the canyon. It took a lot of effort and though we finally made it, we looked back down that waterfall and wondered what the heck we were thinking. Rebel was none too happy about it either, and seemed to get more irritable by the minute. We found enough driftwood at the rocky top of the falls to get a fire started and get the fish fried up, but that was about it. You know the uneasy feeling that several others have mentioned? It was like a switch turned on and we all of a sudden became aware of our surroundings. It grew like a cancer and I actually watched the hair on the back of Rebel's neck stand up, Maggie felt it too and we both noticed that it was getting dark fast down in this canyon. First thought in my head was a cat, and I actually felt a bit better about that because I figured the cat would leave us be, between the fire and the dog. I told Maggie what I thought and she seemed to feel a bit better, too. I did not want to get caught in the dark in the canyon, for a bunch of reasons, flash floods etc. I spied what looked like a mine shaft about 200 feet above us, a heck of a steep climb, but it looked like our best bet. We pulled out our flashlights and by the time we reached it it was pitch black. The dog was a mess by this point, whipping around in circles, whining, yelping and generally being a real pain in the ass. Maggie and I were drenched with sweat and immediately began to freeze. July in the mountains is a weird thing, I have seen blizzard conditions before, 
but this was like someone turned on the deep freeze. We were at what looked like the start of a mine, it only went back about 10 feet, but there was evidence of fires at the mouth, and they curiously looked fresh. I was too tired to think more about it, I knew we had to get out of our wet clothes, pitch the tent, and climb in our bags before we got serious hypothermia. That was no fun, let me tell you, having to do all of that by the light of our rapidly dying flashlight. And there was no firewood anywhere close. I cursed myself several times for letting things get this far out of control. We finally got the tent pitched right there in the back of this little cave, buck naked as we had no dry clothes left. The sleeping bags were slightly damp too, even though we had stuffed them in plastic garbage bags before our swimming expedition up the canyon. We froze. It was miserable. About one in the morning I called Revel into the tent for a little heat. The dog seemed to have calmed down greatly, and with the added heat we drifted off. Sometime during the night I heard something that just about woke me, I was still in a haze, so I fell asleep again immediately. I woke up one other time, because I thought I heard Rebel yip a little bit, but again I was in and out. I put my hand out to pet his head and he licked my hand. I fell asleep again. Maggie later said she fell asleep the same time as I did but never woke up at all during the night. I woke to the most horrible noise I have ever heard come out of a hundred pound woman. Just the most godawful shrieks that I have ever heard. I never want to hear that again. I opened my eyes just in time to see a man at the mouth of the shaft, silhouetted against the morning daylight, looking back at us with the most twisted evil grin I have ever seen on the face of another human. I scrambled to get free of my tightly zipped bag in the little tent while he just crouched there and grinned. When I was just about free, he disappeared. Now, we were granola crunch and tree hug and anti gun nature freaks at the time, so the only thing I had of any consequence as a weapon was my camp knife. I found it after what seemed like hours of searching, but really was probably under a minute. I very cautiously made my way to the entrance, millimeters at a time. The guy was gone. About that time Maggie started screaming and whimpering again so I rushed back to the back of the shaft. She had struggled out of the tent and was pointing at what used to be Revel. His head was nearly severed, and the tent and the bags were ruined with the blood all over everything. She had blood all over her, so the first thing I did was make sure she was not injured. Then I checked myself. We were okay, it was all Rebel's blood. We put on our still damp cold clothes from the night before and then we noticed that our boots were gone. We were in trouble. I had some paracord, so we tied some shirts and towels around our feet and climbed back down towards the creek. We left everything in the mine, except for the knife and some stuff that we shoved in our pockets. It took us eight hours to get back down to the car, and we were like hamburger. Hands, feet, arms and legs scraped raw, bruised and bleeding. We jumped in, the car started right up thankfully and we left a dust cloud that blanketed the valley as we sped down the rough trail toward Durango. We limped into the sheriff's office and we looked like hell. We got our story out, my wife threw tears and me talking way too fast. But finally got it all out. The deputy said that they would go out first thing in the morning and asked us to stay in town. We had no money for a hotel, so he let us stay in a cell after we showered and changed into prison jumpsuits. We were there at the jail waiting when the expedition returned with the convoy of three trucks. I noticed that all the officers, who were quite wet and filthy, gave us dirty looks as they passed us, and the deputy that we had talked to the day before herded us back to his office. Then came the interrogation. Turns out that some animal had spread the dog's remains all down the slide to the creek, and he said that there was nothing else there. No tent, no backpacks, nothing. He asked us if we had any drugs. I did not want to admit to him that we had some herb, so I denied it. It was clear that we were fighting a losing battle. They had come to the conclusion that we were wandering out in the woods high on LSD while a mountain lion had gotten our dog. The bastard even made us change back into our filthy clothes and give back the jumpsuits right then. He told us that he had better never see us again. We left. Maggie was sobbing. I never have been back to Durango. The thing that I still have nightmares about years later, and I have never mentioned this to Maggie, is. The second time I woke up when I heard Rebel yelp, was that when his throat was cut? And if it was, was it the dog who licked my hand before I fell back asleep? 
I still go out in the wilderness, never overnight, out well before dark, only with other people, and always with a big gun. I respect animals, but I fear people. V me. Southern country boy 23 years old. Go camping a mile or so deep in my property woods. Wife comes along and surprises me with a cooler of beer. Drinking succulent Sam Adams as I try to start a fire after a week of hard rain. Toast s'mores with the old lady until bedtime. Go to my small two-man tent. Not enough room to put on or take off my boots inside. Wake up at 12. Immense growling. So loud it wakes up the wife. She looks at me terrified. Our tent has the worst zippers would take a while to escape it. The heavy growling grows even louder. I look my wife in the eyes and let out the rankest fucking fart in the world. She fumbles with the zippers trying to get free of my noxious gas. It smells so bad. Be me 16, summer 2015. Recently moved back to childhood hometown in BC from Ontario, parents divorced was living with mom in Ontario. Dad lives in the boonies, not completely in a woods but rural enough for there to be bears and shit. Younger sister and I had habit of going for walks late at night. One night walking on the road. This was a dirt road that went through some woods no houses nearby. 11 or 12 at night. We suddenly start to hear this creepy music coming from the woods to the side of the road sounded like church music. Sister and I both heard it didn't spook us enough to stop night walking though. Be me, 13 or 14 years old. Live by some lakes in the middle of the forest. Through a connection between two lakes there's a swamp. Through the swamp there is a thin wooden bridge. Used to bike around these two lakes and using the bridge. Only one side of the bridge has a hand guard. While biking an overcast summer day I see a silver box on the handrail on the middle of the bridge. Stop and look at it from distance. Get this fucking awful weird feeling. I've never felt anything so vile ever. Bike the fuck away from there with a feeling someone's watching it all, even several hundred meters away. Get out of the forest and stop at the beach. Some people around there and I manage to shake off the uneasy feeling. Say fuck it and go back for the box. The box is gone. Pick is the bridge. Sign says don't bike on the bridge. This was about six months into working there but here's the first really odd thing that happened. Be me. 21. Working on the second floor of hotel, massive building but second floor is what I'm assigned to. Custodial work, current job then was to clean all the vacant rooms on that floor, do so on the next and so on. Jamming to my tunes as I go about my work. It's the middle of the day, and just suddenly the door slams loud enough for me to hear it over the music. Am a bit freak but at the time chalked it up to maybe some prank. Maybe a guest wanted to be a dick. But that's happened more than the one time, multiple, every time I work in that room on that floor. Yes, lame, but honestly it's small things like doors slamming, footsteps, the sounds of conversations in places closed off at night. Also there's an urban legend I cannot verify about two suicides. Be me, just turned 12. Got a new tent for my birthday. Want to go try it out so bad. Dad won't let me because school week. Looking forward to the weekend. It's Wednesday, find out my dad has night shift Friday when I planned on camping. It's okay for me to go alone. Get excited and nervous. Holy shit I get to go alone. pre mk Vili steal penthouse mag and stash it in my pack. Stay up all night researching bushcraft and what I can do with my cheap Bowie knife. No sleep whatsoever, go through the motions at school. Back at home I grab some 5 hour energy and make a pot of coffee. Out of sugar and milk, I became a man. Fire up PlayStation 2 and play through the night. Friday at school, it's computer lab time. Sluggishly read through creepy pastas. 
barely managed to stay awake through the day. Get home, pack my tent, sleeping bag, and flashlight. Hike past our horse field into the tree line. Sun starts setting. Holy shit I'm about to be alone in the dark. PNG. Quickly set up tent and make fire. Grab penthouse for fun time. Horses start neighing. Something spooked them. Do they always neigh this loud at night? Hear leaves crunching. Oh shit flashlight time. Light shine a few feet away at a squirrel. I hate squirrels. Get ready to feel the release of sleep. It's been too long without it. More crunching, loud captain crunch crunching. Scared so I unzip only enough to poke my head and arm through. Shine light and find squirrel. He's huge, about the size of a raccoon. Too tired to do anything. I'm almost drifting off. Squirrel lets out a sigh. WTF. Sounded like a horse. More heavy crunching coming from farther away. Son. Where are ya? It's my dad thank god. Squirrel still there, starts turning its head towards me. Large mane, long snout, mouth full of flat teeth, shitting myself. Fucked up squirrel thing lets out an eardrum bursting shriek. Boot comes crushing down on its skull. Silence. I'm sorry you had to see that son. I think it's time you go to sleep for a long time. Don't die on me now. I have some stuff I'll post it every now and then to keep the thread for dying. When I was little my dad would take me on yachting trip every year for 23 weeks. Be me 7 years old. On a yachting trip with my father and his friends, some had kids as well. Yacht on lakes because you're cuck. Have fun with kids my age swim in cold water basically good times sleep far from private havens so we can save some cash campfire plus kielbasa equals happy slav boy be around midnight most people already gone me my dad dad's friend and his wife sit around campfire i look at starry sky and my dad is telling me about constellations and how to navigate using them see a moving light point it oh this may be a satellite you have good eyes and on. Get praised. Then I spot another one. And another. There are three lights slowly moving in unison. And when I say slowly I mean like a plane on 10 kilometers altitude, ca. 33,000 feet. The lights are far from each other. Stretch out your arm and hold hand perpendicular to it. Every light is about two lengths of a hand held like that away from the others. At first I was amazed but soon a weird feeling started creeping in. I couldn't tell what was it at first. And then I saw it. Something was blocking starlight, like a giant triangle with lights on vertexes. Maybe it's a plane and on. My dad spent his youth nearby an airfield. As did I. It was a perfect triangle, no blinking lights, no sound. After it passed my dad decided it's time to sleep. Fast forward 10 years. Forgot about this incident a long time ago. I'm doing project on urban legends for school. Searching through wiki. I come across a thing called, Black Triangle. Read about it. Suddenly memories. Oh fuck. Go ask dad about it. He says he remembers something like this. Nope.avi. Avoid looking at stars for years. It still gives me shivers. I've been on slash x slash for some time now and experienced other weird shit, but this one takes the cake for me. Knock the trees with a long stick. If you hear rocks being beaten together. It's time to leave. Guy I knew, ex-military grunt, thick-headed, always trying to talk like John Wayne. I had some black powder muzzle loaders and revolvers, he brought his level 1886, and about a dozen cases of Diet Coke. We like history. I learned pretty quick he wasn't keen on sharing the Coke, he laid the ground rules about it on day one. He was silly most times, but about his Coke his tone turned deadly serious. You'll never meet someone so protective of their corn syrup. Whatever, was my thought. Night came about. My food was off a half mile away in a tree, he 
he said as was too, so I went to sleep. I wake up to hear him sprinting through the woods hollering, so I get up and sprint after him with a flashlight and musket in hand. He's cursing a storm together, but he's a pretty shit runner so I catch him a minute later, he's got no shirt or socks on and looks winded, holding the level in one hand and a light in the other. What the fuck was that? I got up to pee, and when I came back this bear was in my tent and running off with my damn sleeping bag. On the way back to camp I kept finding these cans of Diet Coke on the ground and realized the guy was probably sleeping in a pile of the things. I threw a spare mylar at him later, but he stayed up the whole night rooting around the woods for old Slewfoot. I never saw a man so mad and driven to murder a bear. It was like the bear fucked his wife. He still had a box left in his cooler, but he never got over that the beast would steal his sleeping bag. To this day he tells me the bear wanted his bag, and that he didn't sleep with his coke. Be me. Mom dies when I'm seven. Dad declared unfit due to severe addiction to painkillers. End up living with Uncle Eric, his wife, and my cousin Jeremy. Fast forward 11 years. I'm 18, Jeremy is 20. Just graduate from high school. Jeremy tells us he's rented a trailer for the two of us and our GFs. I ask where. He tells me Vancouver Island. We get on the ferry and get our trailer. Tells us he's been planning this whole trip for a while now, as a graduation present. We are set to be there for two weeks. Have our trailer parked in a pretty secluded, heavily wooded area. First four nights are absolutely uneventful, we swim in the nearby lake, roast food over the fire, dick around, and enjoy nature. Around the fifth day or so, my GF Sam comes running to us one morning. She's scared as fuck. Ask her what the problem is. Someone was apparently in the bushes. Ask her if she saw anything, tells me no, but that it was definitely a person. Throughout the day there does seem to become this aura of us being watched. Not with malicious intent mind you, but it's not a friendly feeling. More? Yes fag. Yes please. Feeling of being watched is not able to be shaken off. There's times where it feels less noticeable, if that's what you could call it but it felt like the eyes in the woods were simply not paying that much attention. Night comes. We set up the pit to make dinner. We're in the middle of eating when there's suddenly this very faint noise. It's rocks, being smacked together. It's almost undeniably the sound of rocks being hit against each other. But it's so far off. It's creepy enough that Sam bolts for the inside of the trailer and locks herself in. Jeremy's GF Hannah turns in at some point. After that Jeremy asks me if I want to go out to the woods to explore the source of the noise. Tell him it could be dangerous. Tells me that's the fun. Shows me he packed a shotgun just in case of wild animals. Take flashlights and head off to the woods. It's not the kind of everything stops quiet but it's still just eerie as fuck. Explore for a good 1530 minutes. Nothing. We head back, disappointed. Once we get to the trailer, head in we sit down for a bit when it happens. Smack, loud 1-2 against the side of the trailer. Go out to see what happens. Huge ass rock got thrown at the side of the trailer. Jeremy and I shine lights into the immediate area, don't see anything but there is the very obvious rustling of bushes, branches being snapped. Someone is running away. Next day comes. We head out to the woods again, Jeremy is still armed. Head for the direction where we heard branches being snapped. Whoever it was that was out there just straight annihilated some brush, like they ran straight through it. At this point I want to not go any further. Jeremy tells me he'll go and find whoever's out there if I'm too scared. Try and reason with him, like what if it's some crazy person in the woods. We argue a bit and I head back to the trailer. A good 45 minutes to an hour passes by. It's Jeremy, he's hauling ass, Jeremy just fumbles as he's running inside. 
Motherfucker is the palest I've ever seen him. He's aiming his gun from the inside, he's shaking. It's a few hours of tension as he seems to be waiting for what he ran from. After he's sure that who, or whatever he was running from didn't follow, he's still rattling, breathing heavily. I ask him what happened out in the woods. Anon, something tried to fucking grab me. He says to me. Grab you? Tells me he only got a glimpse of a person, a big person too as his hands were massive. He could feel the fingers draping over his shoulder. For reference, we're both six foot two. The grip almost tightened when he jumped in panic and bolted faster than a negro robbing a liquor store. Never got a good look at the face but this person to him was quite tall, at least a foot or two above him at his estimate. The girls are frightened, I'm frightened and Jeremy keeps looking out the window to see if it came to follow him. Nothing. This goes on till we anxiously make dinner. Jeremy keeps the shotgun on him at all times now. Every little noise he hears there's cause for him to start aiming. He BTFOs a small bird with the gun at one point but I digress. We're eating, still no activity it's around 1.30, 2 a.m. roughly when we're all woken up by this new sound. Someone is goddamned howling slash screaming slash something. TBH it's more like a bellow. This lasts a few minutes and stops. There's some intermittent hollers as well. The hollers are short and high pitched, the bellows are deeper. This continues on and off throughout the night about a full week into our trip, we're terrified, scared and ready to just be gone. It's this night something new starts happening sound of something hard being smacked against a tree. Jeremy's educated guess is it's some kind of large piece of wood like a branch. This thwacking sound is harsh and violent. No way you couldn't hear it, Jeremy snaps off a branch of his own to start responding. The thwacking goes back and forth between the two of them for a bit, probably three hours. After that, nothing. We're all unable to sleep that night. It's been about two days after that, nothing has happened. We think maybe we talked it out. Nope. It's late one night and we're preparing for bed when we start hearing some noise. It's rocks. Rocks of various size being pelted against the trailer. Jeremy grabs the shotgun and heads out just itching to shoot at something. He starts shooting randomly. It doesn't seem like he hit anything. The rock pelting keeps going for about an hour, stops, then resumes. Like the bellows this also is an on and off occurrence. Next morning we start looking to see where this person could be hiding this entire time. We're not expecting to see it. There's this huge, fur-covered person. I guess it's about our size and it's staring us dead on. Jeremy lines himself up to shoot it. Not sure how or why but he misses the shot. Get a holler for our trouble before it runs off into the woods. We tell the girls what happened. They're freaked the fuck out. Night comes and like the nights before there's violent thwacking of branches against trees. It's loud and it's angry sounding. Hey Jeremy I think we pissed it off. The knocking stops. We're absolutely scared shitless for some reason. After a few hours of complete silence, we hear a massive thud. And another. It's more rocks, big fuckers too. All four of us head out, Jeremy armed with the shotgun, the girls and I have flashlights. That's when Sam screams bloody fucking murder. She Usain bolts her way back inside, Jeremy tries and take a shot, I grab the light she dropped. He's massive, taller than the one we saw in the daytime. The best I could compare it to is if you added a few inches to Shaq's height. What brief glimpse I got of its face it's snarling. Like it's pissed, goddamn there's two of them. One smaller and the bigger one. Those are the ones I know of. The larger one is bold enough to show itself. We do not sleep at all the next few nights. It's our last night before we go back. It's peaceful and quiet. We are all suspicious. As we're packing our shit and leaving we see the larger one, in broad daylight. Brief few seconds though. It stares us down as we leave. We all get back home and the first thing me and Jeremy do, because our house is kinda in the woods is lock all. The doors out of fear. 
Me and Jeremy still had sleepless nights for months after that. Every little sound startled the fuck out of us. The girls were like this too. A few years after what happened, Jeremy got into Sasquatch research. He's determined to kill one. I eventually married Sam. Despite what happened I still enjoy the outdoors, I just carry a firearm on me now, and a knife just in the event I see one of these things again. Haven't found anything from Ontario in my files unfortunately, but here's a story out of Vancouver. It takes a while to get to the main event, but it's a very comfy read. My grandfather was a badass. He was born in Alberta during the early 30s, and raised his three brothers on a reservation from the time he was nine. His parents had left for British Columbia with their only daughter, promising to return, but none of the boys ever saw them again. To make ends meet, he learned carpentry and worked as a laborer, and bare-knuckle boxed against older men for extra cash. He learned how to track and hunt, and always came home with something to eat when work was scarce. But when he was 14, he put the second oldest brother in charge of the household and left the res in search of his parents and a better life. That was the last time he saw any of his family members. He spent several months riding the rails, befriending some transients and using his fighting skills to defend himself against others. He eventually made his way to Vancouver, the last known whereabouts of his parents and sister, and started working in a pulp mill. At 17, he met my grandmother, and the two eventually married, which led him to give up his search for his family. They bought some land, and he spent his free time building several houses, which still stand today. One of those sat on the land he bought with my grandmother, which included acres of wooded area. On this land, my grandparents kept horses and dogs and small farm animals for eggs and meat. My aunt was born in the early 50s, and then my mother came along right before the end of the decade. As far as I've heard, nothing bad or strange really happened until my mom found an old Ouija board and played with it by herself, although I don't know if that actually has anything to do with the following events. My mother was around eight when she was riding her horse through the wooded part of their acreage, when the horse stopped dead in its tracks. My mom tried to spur it on, but it was frozen in fear, and all of a sudden she smelled something like rotting garbage and meat. She pulled back on the reins and the horse instantly turned and took off back towards the house, almost knocking her off its back several times along the way. Afterwards, that horse was never the same, if she went near it it would try to kick her, and if she got on it, it would fall backwards, trying to crush her beneath it. At one point, it seemed to be back to its old self again, letting her climb onto it. But once she did, it ran towards the road and stopped abruptly, bucking her forward into the path of an oncoming car. My grandpa saw it happen and put a shotgun up to its head, but the horse just kept breathing heavily and staring straight ahead. My mother barely missed being run over by a car that saw the horse coming and managed to swerve out of the way, and my grandmother begged my grandfather not to shoot the horse. He finally decided to give it away when he saw my mother wasn't badly injured. That same horse fell on the next person to ride it, breaking her collarbone, and the father did what my grandpa said he should have done the first time. After that, animals started going missing, and one of the hunting dogs was attacked by something during the night. It survived but the poor dog was badly injured. My grandpa set out some traps and stayed in the hayloft above the barn with a shotgun and rifle beside him, and slept out there for several nights. He figured it was foxes, or maybe coyotes or wolves, or even a desperate bear, which is what he attributed the smell in the woods to. He figured it was also the reason the horse lost its mind. But nothing came the entire time he slept out there, and eventually he figured it had moved on to easier prey or died. The day after he stopped sleeping in the barn, my mom was out near the tree line playing with the injured dog as it was healing. Out of nowhere, the dog started sniffing the air, then positioned itself between my mom and the trees, growling and barking. My grandpa heard the noise and came out, then stopped dead in his tracks. He called back to my grandmother to bring his rifle, then whistled for the dogs. My grandma came out, handed him his gun, then asked what was going on. As the dogs all started to react like the first one, my grandfather pointed to one of the treetops, which looked longer and thicker than those around it, but it was very slightly moving. There was something up there. When grandpa would later retell the story, 
he said whatever it was must have been at least six feet tall, but it was probably a good bit taller. He took aim and fired just as he saw a pair of wings start to open up. Whatever was up there was watching them, but he beat it to the punch. It was a kill shot, directly in the chest with a high-powered rifle, and he instantly started running forward with all of the dogs following him as the thing plummeted to the ground, the breaking of tree branches wholly unmistakable. When he reached the impact point, he raised his rifle again and commanded the dogs forward to flush it out, but they all just stood in the spot and kept spinning around, trying to catch a scent that seemingly disappeared. A pile of broken branches lay in the obvious landing spot, but beyond that there was no proof that anything had happened. No body, no blood, no trail. It had either disappeared or gone straight back up the way it came. He searched those woods for several days but never found a sign of what that thing was, and they didn't see it or experience issues with the animals after that. Decades later, when he was dying, he kept talking about how he saw something. In his delirium, he referred to it as an alien, but said it was coming back for him. I've never seen that man scared of anything in my life, but there was actual panic and fear in his voice. A few nights before he died, he had already been too weak to stand on his own for several days, and my grandmother awoke to the sound of a gunshot. She ran outside, fearing the worst, and saw my grandpa lowering his rifle, staring at something in the distance. She took the gun away and helped him back inside, and that was it. I don't know if whatever it was actually did come back for him, or if it was a hallucination of an old memory, but I'd like to think he went out with a final fire to the thing that tried to torment his family all those years ago. I'm going to repost a story I shared in a Mexican stories thread because it fits the theme here. This story was sent to me over a year ago, and I green texted it to share on 4chan. Note, I'm not great at green text. Anyway, the story itself is very bizarre, and I'm not sure if you will enjoy it, but I did. Mom's family is Mixteco race. We don't usually interact with our indigenous family because we live in California and they live in Oaxaca. Turning 15 years old, I go out to spend a month in Oaxaca with my grandpa and my family. Grandpa is a native guy, and he's hunted all his life. He's also an excellent tracker. He decides he wants to take me hunting even though I've never even used a gun before shows me how to shoot before we leave so that I'm not entirely clueless. Fast forward a couple hours. Grandpa and I are deep into the Oaxacan forest. We hear a noise. Grandpa can't identify it. He pauses, listening. Tells me to walk until I'm about 50 meters ahead of of him and then stop. Says it will help us locate where the sound is coming from, I don't know, I've never hunted. Nervous, but kind of excited too. I move slowly, deeper and deeper into the forest, as quietly as I can. Suddenly a deep fog rolls in, and I mean deep, it's everywhere. Not sure what to do, so I just keep going. After walking the 50 meters as instructed, I squat behind some bushes and wait. And wait. After a bit, I call out, Grandpa no response. Kind of starting to panic a bit, thinking maybe he lost me. Just then an owl swoops in. A big white adult owl, startles the fuck out of me. I should also mention here that I'm terrified of owls and always have been. I've been attacked by two. Once when I was a baby and once when I was 10. I have a huge scar on my scalp from where it attacked me, and I lost a piece of my lip. Owl lands on a nearby branch. Cue my fear of owls. I start freaking out. I hear my grandpa's voice just then. Anon? I stand up, quickly. Grandpa? He doesn't respond, just keeps calling my name. His voice is getting closer though. The owl starts moving around on the branch, shifting from side to side like it's agitated. Hear grandpa's voice call out again, but this time I notice it sounds weird. Feeling seriously spooked now, I decide to stay hidden in the bushes. Grandpa's voice keeps getting closer. Suddenly it's really close, and I see something step through the bushes. But the fog is super dense, can't really make it out at first. 
I can only tell that it's some type of animal. Keep watching it until finally I can make it out. It's a taper, pick related. Feel myself overwhelmed with fear for some reason. I almost feel like crying. The taper raises its head like it's sniffing the air. But then it opens its mouth. Anon? I'm getting uneasy here just writing this, instantly think about shooting this thing, but I'm still pretty useless with a gun. The taper gets closer. By this point the owl is making all sorts of noises, sounds like it's squealing. Taper looks over at the owl and calls my name again. The owl stops squealing all at once and locks eyes with me for a moment. Suddenly it dives down and begins to claw at the taper's eyes. Blood is flying everywhere. It's dark black, almost like Chinese ink. That's enough for me, I take off running. I can hear the taper start chasing after me, but it sounds like the owl is still attacking it. The taper is still calling my name but the voice sounds different now, really high pitched. I hear a loud crunch. Look back as I'm running, the taper has the owl in its jaws. Suddenly grandpa is is rushing over to me. Stay on the ground. He yells. He shoots at the taper, lands two bit shots, black ink blood going everywhere, but the animal won't go down. Its voice gets even louder, grandpa keeps shooting, taper finally turns and runs into the forest. Grandpa checks on me and then we go over to where the taper got shot. Two bullet on the ground there, covered in blood. Grandpa says the taper wasn't an animal. He picks up the body of the white owl and says, this wasn't an animal either. He tells me it was a relative of ours, but he's gone now. I cried on the way back home, and Grandpa told everyone what happened. The family held a little ritual for the dead owl, and Grandpa showed me a framed photograph of his brother. He said that it was his brother who was controlling the owl, it was him who saved me. I never went back to fucking Oaxaca. Okay here it is. Not truly in a woods, but sort of fits. This took place back home on my reservation, I'm Algonquin First Nation from Canada. On the res, traditional beliefs and legends of the paranormal are still big part of our community. The paranormal is a regular part of life. We believe in a spirit world and we believe that sometimes these beings can cross over into our world and maybe even live amongst us. Anyways, here's the story. It was the fall of 2011. I was 16 years old and living in a city near the reservation with my mom. Every weekend we'd go back home to the res to see my dad and my little brother. One Friday, during the drive back home, I got a text from a friend of mine. There was a party that night and she wanted to know when I'd be home so she could come pick me up. I gave her a time and she told me she'd swing by. My mom and I get home and as soon as we stepped inside the house, we see my dad and my cousin sitting at the kitchen table drinking some beers. They're both cops on the res, and beers on a Friday evening means that they had a particularly tough week at work. Typically, the toughest cases to deal with are child abuse and molestation, so a part of me feels sad upon seeing them. They both look tired and drained, but they're happy to see us. We say our greetings, catch up a little, and my dad asks me if I have any plans. I mention the party and tell him where it'll be. He and my cousin share a weird look. I don't know, should we tell her? My cousin said, looking at my dad. He laughed, and they decided that I should probably know what's been going on since I'd be going to a house pretty deep in the woods later that evening, they start with the first strange call they got on Monday night. An older woman called saying that people were outside of her house knocking on all of her windows. She said she couldn't see anybody, but there must have been at least three people judging by all the different locations of the knocking. They arrive at the woman's home, inspect all around the house, even check the woods, but nothing comes up. They tell her that it's probably just some teenagers playing tricks on her and that there isn't much else they can do besides patrol around the area in case they come back. On Wednesday night, the same woman called again with the same problem. She said people were knocking on all her windows. It had rained that day and there was mud all around this woman's home, so they figured that at the very least, they'd find footprints, but they couldn't find a thing. This is when they started feeling like something was off, because there were huge patches of mud everywhere. They thought maybe the woman was lying, but they just told her the same thing they told her a few nights prior. By Thursday night, everyone on the res was talking. It turns out, 
This woman wasn't the only one experiencing the knocking. She was just the only one to call the police. People were linking it to supernatural causes but my dad was still sure it was just a group of teens pranking people. But then they got another call from the same woman for the same reason. They rushed over and were met with the same situation, except this time, the woman's neighbor walked over looking pale as a ghost. Is this about the knocking? He asked, looking very shaky. Yeah, did you see something? The man nodded and said, you guys are gonna think I'm crazy. He goes on to explain that he'd stepped outside for a cigarette on his front porch when he heard knocking. He looked around and saw something by the old woman's house. There was a black figure standing outside her window looking into her home. He said it looked like a person, completely made out of shadow but he could tell it was solid. He couldn't make out any features on it. He stared at it, completely in shock, and watched the thing as it knocked a couple of times and then darted around the house knocking on every single window. He said it moved too fast to be human. It was practically a blur. It went around the house a few times, then it ran across the road into the tree line, behind one tree in particular, as though it were hiding. The man was frozen, but he couldn't look away. The black shadow then leaned out from behind the tree, staring directly at him with yellow eyes that reflected light like a cat's, and then it smiled, showing many small, pointed teeth. I almost shit my pants, he tried to joke, but his voice was still shaking. My dad didn't know what to make of this, but after checking on the old woman and finding her okay, although shaken, he told them that he'd keep an eye on things and had just put it out of their minds. Fast forward to Friday. By this point, everyone's got their own story. In addition to numerous people experiencing the knocking, there were also quite a few more sightings, and everyone described the thing exactly the same to my dad. One woman was taking her trash bin out to the road when she thought she saw someone in her peripheral vision standing near the trees. As she walked back up the driveway to her home, she felt like she was being watched. Right before she was about to open her door to go back inside her home, she looked back and saw two reflective yellow eyes watching her from the trees. She said they were about five feet off the ground. Another couple was driving at night and they saw a humanoid figure standing in the middle of the road. As they got closer, they slowed down, and it turned around to face them. They saw the figure had reflective yellow eyes and the sharp, pointed teeth as it smiled at them. They stopped the car, too afraid to get any closer to it, until they decided to just speed past it. It was a narrow road and the figure was only a few feet away as they drove by it. They said it was staring at them the whole time. You sure you still want to go to that party? My dad asked. But my friends were already pulling into the driveway, so I gave my family hugs and kisses and said goodbye. They told me to be careful. I wasn't too concerned though. A common belief among native people is that negative energy attracts negative energy, so an evil spirit will be drawn to people with unresolved issues or traumas. But if you're someone who is spiritual, self-aware, and basically a good person, that, in and of itself, will be protective. I get to the party and within 20 minutes, the conversation shifts towards all the paranormal experiences people have been having. I'm really curious about what everyone has to say, because they have stories that I hadn't heard yet. But my friend couldn't hold her alcohol very well, we were 16, after all, and she was crying and I was trying to make her feel better while listening to everyone's stories. One of the people at the party was related to the the smoking man that my father first talked to, the one who first described the shadow thing that darted into the trees. This person told us that the experience shook the smoking man up and he had smudged his entire home. Smudging is something our people do when we're looking for extra protection against paranormal entities. The man also went to visit multiple elders around the community, asking for advice or if they knew what was going on. It's commonly on the res that paranormal experiences don't happen as often as they used to. If you talk to the elders they have endless stories, and even more advice about how to protect yourself compared to younger generations. Anyway, the man had gone to visit some elders, and one of them had explained that the shadow thing was evidence that someone was doing an unauthorized shaking tent ceremony. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up, but it's basically, and I'm generalizing, like a Ouija board session that takes place inside a tent. People stand around the tent, while the shaman goes inside and asks questions. The tent begins to shake and you can hear the voices of spirits coming through. I've never personally been to a shaking tent ceremony because we haven't had a good enough reason to make one. Typically, our ancestors used them when they were starving in the dead of winter and needed to know where the nearest food source was. 
My mom's been to one, and her story is absolutely crazy. She described multiple voices, men and women, all speaking the native tongue. She said they were very upset that the people were doing a shaking tent ceremony since they weren't yet on the verge of death. The people tried to explain that we're only doing the ceremony to prove that it was real. This was at a time when our people felt like we were losing our culture as a result of residential schools. But the explanations didn't help. The spirits were angry about this, saying that the bridge between the two worlds should never be opened unless absolutely necessary because you don't know who you're communicating with. It could be good spirits, or it could be evil ones. It might be ancestors, but you never know. Anyways, back to the smoking man. The elders told him that the shadow thing with yellow eyes that everyone was hearing and seeing was a spirit. It crossed over into our world because of a shaking tent ceremony. Someone on the reserve had been doing them without the consultation of the elders, they said. At this point two of the drunkest dudes at the party started saying disrespectful things about the shadow entity, trying to act macho. Most of us were looking at each other like, why would you disrespect an evil spirit? That's exactly how you attract it to you. That's when I went back to the sunroom to console my drunk, crying friend. But while I was with her I noticed that the rocking chair outside on the porch was rocking back and forth by itself. I looked away immediately, refusing to make direct eye contact, but I could see it moving in my peripheral vision. We're raised in our culture to ignore paranormal experiences. Spirits feed on the energy that people put towards them, so if you freak out, get angry, yell at it, start crying, or anything like that, it will stick around once. That's what it wants. It thrives on energy of any kind. Five minutes or so go by and I'm still seeing the rocking chair move out of the corner of my eye. Suddenly I hear a commotion. One of the other girls claims to have seen the spirit, we later nicknamed it Kokoki, an Algonquin word for monster. She said she was listening to the boys talk about the spirit, when she saw one of the boys staring very strangely out onto the balcony behind her. She turned around to see what he was looking at, and through the window was the shadow spirit sitting on the rocking chair, literally three feet away from her, smiling. The boy who had been staring out there sprinted towards the balcony doors, slammed them open, and charged at the spirit. I went outside to check on this boy and found him staring into the woods. He turned back to look at me and said, get everyone inside. The tone of his voice made me automatically obey. He came back inside and told everyone to clean up the place so that we could leave, and we spent a while just cleaning. We heard knocking coming from all around the house the entire time. Finally, we prepared to leave. People piled into their cars and began to take off. Me and the boy were walking towards his truck, he was going to drive me home, when suddenly he began to rush me and push me into the truck. He jumped in too and peeled out of there. I asked him why he did that but he refused to talk about it. A few days later, I ended up hanging out with him and he told me his experience of that night. While the other boys were disrespecting the spirit, he saw it appear out of thin air on the rocking chair out in the balcony. He made eye contact with it and couldn't look away. He and the spirit were staring each other down, and that's when one of the girls saw his expression. She turned around, saw the spirit, and immediately screamed. He said it was instinct to defend his friends, and that's why he ran outside and charged at it. He said that the feeling he was getting from the Kokogi was almost like he was daring him to do something. But the second he got up, the Kokogi stood up and ran into the woods, disappearing from the patio in a blur. When the boy outside, he stood on the lawn and saw it standing at the tree line, looking right at him with a smile on its face. Later, as we walked to the truck, he saw it again, and that's why he had pushed me into his truck. After he dropped us all off at our houses, he and his friend realized that they never locked the door to the cottage, so they went back. But his friend was too scared to go in, even though it was his cottage, so the boy went in by himself. The second he opened the door, he saw the thing standing inside the living room. The boy locked the door as fast as he could, and hopped back in the truck. The two peeled out of the driveway. Sightings continued for a few days after that. It was the talk of the res, but eventually everything just stopped. No more knocking, no more sightings. Everyone was curious about what happened to spirit. What exactly was it? And would it come back? Eventually, word came down to us from up north where sightings of the same spirit were seen in a different community. White people in the town just north of us were reporting strange sightings, and other reservations near us were as well. The way the stories were coming in, it was like the spirit was traveling north. Anyways, 
It's 2018 now and no one else on my res has had any sighting of this particular thing. Damn, I'm late. Be me, 2018, derping about Ina Woods with Doge. Be hunting mooses, cause Alaska things. Stumble over weird shit in tundra. Defuk look down, see corner of grave house looks old AF. Grave houses are placed over our graves here Ina Woods, okay. Spoop levels intensifying. Doge suddenly drops to ground, cowering, looking into heavy alder growth. Doge nopes TF out like he just saw Lucy. Be very spoop now. Train point 338 win mag on bushes and shite. Big gun should save me, right? Nope.png. Can't exactly describe the deep guttural sensation of dread, even harder to describe what I say n. Slowly back away, ready to blow this fuck away. Notice nauseating putrid cinnamon and rotten human entrail smell all around. Nope intensifying keep backing up, not wanting to turn away from this night terror inducing grinning face hovering in bushes. Start calling for doge, fucker lit out without me. Feels bad man. WMV. Finally cross into sunlight slash open woods. Turn and run like scared little pizza, leaving trails of piss and excrement for a quarter mile. Find doge at the ATV on trail WTF.jpg. Only speak of it to two elders, Grandmother says never go back there, don't bother those graves again. Grandmom won't tell me about what I say n. Oh well dot mpg. So yeah. There's that. V me. 15, freshman in high school. There is a big ass park with a huge wooden castle near my neighborhood, pick related is the actual park. There is multiple paths and trails that go through the park, and connect to nearby neighborhoods and whatnot. One of the paths is one I would take through the park and past the castle when walking to my friend's house. One weekend night me and my friend who were chilling at my house, decided to head over to his place and it stay the night there. Roughly 11 p.m. or so. Parks closed and no technically no one is supposed to be there. Extremely dark out. Me and him leave me house and start making our way towards his. Get to the park and on the path to his place. As we started passing the castle I got this sudden sense of dread and fear. Tried to just shake it off. Me and my friend then stopped dead in our tracks, when we heard what sounded like a girl's voice come from the castle. Were spooked for only a second though, and just assumed it was some people drinking slash smoking slash fucking or whatever. That quickly changed when the inaudible female voice screamed as loud as she, or whatever it was, could. This scream was accompanied by more screams and other voices coming from the castle. They weren't just regular screams, they sounded almost demonic and some of them were unnaturally deep screams slash bellows. Me and my friend ran as fast as we could. We both sprinted the entire way and didn't stop until we got out of the park slash woods and were on his street. Got inside his house locked the door and headed straight into his basement. Safe to say we both did not sleep well that night. To this day still don't know what the fuck happened and have been back to that park a few times at night, nothing happened. Sure thing. Here it is. I might have shared this in a past thread, I can't remember. I recently received a telephone call from an experiencer who is a medical professional living in Palm Springs, California. I'll refer to him as Mike. This specific incident occurred in the winter of 1999 when Mike, his brother and two other friends were young men living in Southeast Los Angeles. One afternoon, they were hanging out at one of their homes, when they all experienced a sensation of urgency. Each man described the same feeling that they must get to a certain location ASAP. They somehow knew where they needed to go, but had no idea what they would find there. Their urge to get to the mysterious location was so intense that they actually stole a relative's van. The group drove northeast towards the San Bernardino Mountains, an area that none of the young men was familiar with. Mike stated that he had no recollection of the trip, aside from feeling that they were heading in the right direction. Suddenly. The entire group screamed in unison, stop. They found themselves on a gravel road, 
and they quickly piled out of the vehicle. By this time it was totally dark, but they all knew in what direction they needed to walk. Mike said that they were walking through an area with large pine trees, and it was much cooler than the city but no one was complaining. They hiked for about 45 minutes, until they all felt that they had reached their destination. In a small clearing, a black rock was found that was shaped like a perfect cube. Mike thinks it was about 5 feet square, and all of the young men could see it without a flashlight. They scampered onto the top of the monolith and collapsed into a deep sleep. Then suddenly, they all woke to the sound of something heading in their direction. There were hundreds of white orbs of various sizes darting through the trees around them. They were making very unusual sounds which scared Mike and his friends. They immediately jumped off the rock and began to run in the direction of Van, but the orbs chased them through the forest the entire way, buzzing all around them. They knew that they were getting close to the van, when the orb suddenly disappeared. Within seconds, they were abruptly confronted by several large dark-colored vehicles with bright searchlights. Mike said that he doesn't know how or from where the vehicles suddenly appeared. They seemed to emerge from out of nowhere. A loud human voice yelled, What the hell are you doing here? Mike said that none of them responded to the voice. They were too confused as to where the vehicles came from to answer. All of a sudden they were hit with an awful bellowing that seemed to come from above, and they all fell to the ground. That's the last thing that either of the young men remembers from the location. Many hours later, Mike said that his brother was shaking him awake. The four men were all in the back of the van, each suffering from a throbbing headache. Mike opened the side door. He said that as the sunlight hit him in face he instantly felt ill. The young men looked around and realized that they were in a grocery store parking lot. People were going about their business, giving them strange looks. Mike stated that they eventually figured out that they were in Riverside, California, but they had no idea how they got there. Mike says that after this incident he and his brother have both had encounters with unknown beings, but he's unable to recall many details. I asked why he was coming forward after 18 years. Mike said that he wants answers but has been unable to get any information. He doesn't remember the location of the monolith, almost as if it was wiped from his memory. But he and the others know it happened exactly the way it was described here. This thread warms my heart, I haven't seen this much OC contained in one place since 2012. Anyways, I've got a story from my old man I'd like to share. It's not anything too spooky, just something weird that I think you guys will like. 60s. Dad is 910. Rural town. Fucking around with friends in a woods. Exploring, running, etc. Dad finds a June bug, shows his friends, pick related. Someone goes and grabs an old jam jar to keep the little guy in. They imprison, my dad's words, not mine the beetle and forget about it like the retards they were. In the middle of playing tag when they hear this loud buzzing. One of my dad's friends sees something and almost shits himself. Dad turns to see thousands of June bugs flying towards them. Everyone collectively shits themselves and books it. Dad comes back the next day and the jar is gone. I'm not sure if it's entirely true but he insists that it's real and it's the reason that he became an entomologist. What do you think, slash x slash? 15 years old. On vacation at the village my grandma grew up. Spent the entire day on the nearby small town. Decide it's time to get back home since it got dark. End up going through the woods because would be fun. Halfway through start listening to footsteps. Turn around, nothing's there, who would have thought? Keep walking, footsteps continue. Sticks breaking, bushes moving, you get the idea. Turn phone's flashlight on. Literally no living creature is around. By this time I'm ultra spooked. Keep walking as fast as I can. Footsteps stop. 510 minutes later I'm out of the woods. Go home and instantly tell my grandmother what happened. Tells me it was the ghost of a girl who shot herself in those woods because her father wouldn't let her marry. Some dude she was in love with. 
didn't enter the woods again. Nothing weird happens for the rest of my stay. Be me. Be chilling out on the front porch of my house one night. Sitting, watching YouTube on my phone. I see it out the corner of my eye. I start seeing a solid black shape walking up the driveway for context the front porch overlooks it. Jump off porch to follow the shape. It's gone when I manage to get to the driveway. Go to a cathedral in Mumbai, India. I was feeling like a superhuman that day, sad but ecstatic and extra perceptive. Later go to a beach by the cathedral, there's also some old Hindu temple there. The dogs near the beach were looking at me with teary eyes and let out a smell, all of them as I walked past them. For some reason, I put hand on my forehead. In my third eye, I see a little entity shaped like a cartoon ghost white cape, but it wasn't cloth. It was more like a cloud. The thing has bloodshot eyes and flew away over the sea like it was blown away by a strong wind. I remember looking it up on the internet that day but I can't it anymore no matter how hard I look. It was related to Hindu underworld, like Hades. I was told from my mother's perspective. 1989 my parents were living together in an apartment, years before I'm born. At night, father always slept on the wall side of the bed because my mother liked to use the lamp to read until she fell asleep. Several times a month she was woken up by my father's anxious movements at night. He would pull her face tightly into his chest and cover her with his arms. He would look wide awake when she looked to his face but was silent and did not respond to her. Every morning following a night like this she would find him already awake before her. She would see that he would always swap places with her on the bed while she slept and wait for her to wake. Up before leaving the bed, or if he was out of bed he would be sitting somewhere near the front door sipping. Coffee with his revolver tucked in his waistband. He said things were okay so she assumed it was about night terrors or sleepwalking without questioning. Eventually time for my father to leave home to the army. Mother starts hearing the floorboards of the hallway outside of the bedroom creaking while she's up late at night reading. If she would check the front door, it was always still double locked and chained. Later phone call with my father she brought up the noises. Father tells her that he's not surprised and explains what he heard and saw those nights, and that he was hoping he was just losing it. He was a light sleeper and explained that after the creaking woke him up at night he would look up to the bedroom doorway, had no door, and about one-fifth chance he would see a very tall silhouette wearing what looked like a long overcoat and a Homburg hat standing in the hallway facing him. Dark figure would stay for some time and then silently shuffle, sidestep, into the hallway. Father he never slept those nights he saw or heard anything and he was in the process of installing a bedroom door before he had to leave. Mother never stays up late in that apartment again. I don't know if the thread is still alive but I'm still gonna share my story of the entity, which has been following me for the past decade. Picks up in the end. Be me 13 yo kid living in rural Germany. In-law family is the superstitious kind and quite often talks about the ghosts in the farmhouse. Like my dad I never cared for ghosts and thought it was nonsense. Decided to live with mom for a period of my life which turned out to be a mistake. For context after the second WW buildings were hastily constructed and barely insulated. Walls were paper thin. I lived in the attic at this point. Sometime later a staircase was constructed through the room connecting the lower part of the house with the upper one. In front of the door a hastily constructed platform with laminate flooring which creaked when stepped on. At 14 or so I started to feel being watched while going downstairs in the nights and morning. While I was gaming in the night at around 3 am I heard the floorboard creaking and went instantly silent. Usually you would be able to hear someone walking up the stairs or towards the room as doors needed to be opened. This started to be the norm and I got used to accept the being watched feeling. While I was 15 I saw a round shaped head peeking around a doorway like in the old cartoons where they were just looking sideways. After this encounter I've stopped going out of my room from 10pm to 7am. 
after the encounter the knocking started. On some days not all I heard a knocking on my door in the night. The retarded kid I was opened the door. I know big mistake. Since I've opened the door I felt being watched from the far corner of my room some nights while I still heard the knocking from time to time as well as the daily creaking of the floorboard. One evening while I was home alone the Wi-Fi turned off. I went downstairs to turn it back on. 30 minutes later I heard someone walking up the stairs and doing the daily night routine my mom always did. Around 3 hours later a car pulled up to the house and soon after my mom opened my door and told me she was back home. I've literally had any cold drained out of my face at this point and asked if she hasn't been home 3 hours before. She wasn't home at this point and the guy she was with told me the same. I asked the neighbors if they heard the stairwell which is quite loud and creaky and everyone heard it. FFW 4 years. Everything has been as normal as it got. The creaking and the feeling of being watched never went away but I haven't had any major encounters to this point. I've moved back to my dad's house since I had a huge fight with my mom. I haven't heard anything anymore, be it knocking creaking, nor the feeling of being watched. In the first week I overheard my mother-in-law talking about a bad and angry presence in the house. In the second week I saw her cleaning the house and trying to seal it off. I asked her why she was doing this and was told ever since I moved back and she felt a presence of something. After the cleansing she saw a tall big man approach 6 FT9 with a grayish blank face. He wore a long trench coat and a hat of the Akubra type. Don't pin me on the hat. Since then there was nothing in the house but I started to hear loud banging from the barn door which connects the house to the barn. Sometimes the dogs started barking Burr quickly went silent and started whimpering. FFW a bit. I was alone this day and was doing the nightly chores of walking around the farm closing the animal pens and the barn. On my way back through the barn I felt being watched. Soon after a hay bale came flying into my direction from the hayloft landing shortly in front of me. I was properly freaked out and about to nope the fuck out when I saw something big and black in my peripheral vision moving behind some bales towards the barn door. As dumb as I could be I followed suit and went to check for someone. It was all empty. After this I've rarely heard anything anymore. Everyone seems to be asleep so fuck it. Sorry if long. I'll post some family stories of mine and if any Anon could explain some later things, it'd be appreciated. But first background context. With exception of me for some reason, literally every member of my family has had a significant encounter with the paranormal mostly good sometimes bad. And this is without even searching for it. Been searching for something paranormal from the US to Europe for 24 years now and never had any experience with any sadly. First one is a story my mom told me. My family comes from Haiti. In before shithole country. It's a poor state but the people are kind and generous. They have to be since they may fuck with the wrong person. Haiti's culture is like Catholicism and voodoo living side by side. Nearly 100% of Haiti believes in God. But that same percent also believe voodoo is real. My mom grew up under Papa Doc, the dictator of Haiti put in by America. Under his reign people walked on eggshells as people do under a dictatorship but that didn't stop my mom's uncle at the time. He was pretty much the neighborhood drunk. Not a mean drunk either. He was a fun alcoholic but he often came home from the bars when it was already dark out. It's less taboo today but in 60s 70s Haiti this was something you never did under any circumstances. This is because the night didn't belong to God but voodoo doctors. Even the dictators didn't fuck with them. Some of these doctors were nice. As my mom's uncle told it, he was coming back from the bar closer at nearly 3 a.m. at night walking through the outskirts of the capital back home. The only thing lighting his path home was the stars and moon above him. As he walked along in his drunken stupor, he bumped directly into a man so tall he seemed to be on stilts. My granduncle hadn't noticed him before somehow as the steps of the man were silent despite the night begin quiet. The man bent over and looked down at him and said, People like you shouldn't be out at this hour. The streets don't belong to you at night. My granduncle was frozen in fear as the tall man talked. 
The moment the tall man finished, my granduncle sprinted home. After that he never had another drop of alcohol. Not at bars, parties or funerals. Another side story which is more Haiti than my personal family is people coming back from the dead. Google Haitian zombie and you'll understand. People in Haiti don't embalm the dead. Too expensive so they're buried as is quickly. When my mom was a preteen an old voodoo doctor died. When he died, men and women started showing up in the neighborhood. Family members and friends who had been thought dead recently and sometimes decades. Once the voodoo doctor died, none of them had any recollection of their time as his workers. Their last coherent thought was watching their own funerals. Trapped inside their bodies they watched as people held wakes over them, as the coffin was shut upon them, as they were lowered, and sometimes when there was little enough dirt, hear their own eulogies. After that they heard dirt being moved, most likely the voodoo doctor coming to claim them, and fast forward decades for some of them they remember waking up and walking back home. Mom said it was bizarre to see someone you know you buried talking to you years later. Family side time, I don't know about my dad or his family as I don't have a good relationship with either. But my brother and my mom have a few experiences. For my mom, she's been visited by angels multiple times. When my brother was young he had a health issue, I won't disclose what since the procedure that solved that health issue is named after his doctor. Suffice to say, he was a child that had a body function that performed at an incredibly fast rate. Faster than humans should be able to handle. This had been going on for a couple of years at this point. One day she told me, she was at the end of her rope and was exhausted at how much my brother was suffering. So she went to church like a good Catholic and prayed. As she prayed, an Asian man behind her tapped her on the shoulder. He said, do not be afraid. Your son will be all right. The doctors will check on his next visit and it will all be gone. My mom's response was to immediately grab her baby and run as fast as she could to her car and lock the door. When my mom brought my brother to his next checkup, his disease was gone. His body was functioning normally, no damage, like it never even happened. The irony now isn't lost on her that the angel spoke to her literally like an angel and the Bible does, do not be afraid and all. She's had other angelic experiences as well with other family members that survived severe issues. But they're longer to type out and I'll do that tomorrow if there is interest. Unto my brother. Now my brother is a strong tall guy. Resilient sort of man trains himself to do Spartan races and owns a dog so large it could down and kill a fully grown man easily. But even he has shivers recounting this story. One day as a teen, he had multiple long and vivid nightmares. The most notable one he remembered being one where he was chained. He woke up paralyzed, all he could move were his eyes. He looked into the corner of the room and saw something standing there in flowing robes. He said he knew instantly what it was upon seeing it. It was death staring at him from his closest. Not getting closer but just staring at him. As he began to move his body again he shifted up and looking back at his closest and saw it was gone. Month later, he dove into a pool at the shallow end like a dummy and broke his wrist. When they did a full body scan to make sure nothing else was broken they found a growth in him. It was cancer. Luckily, he's fine now. He's had other experiences I'm sure. But I can never manage to get him to tell me them. Makes me wonder, I'm not lying when I say I've never had a paranormal experience. Closest I've had is paranormal adjacent. And as I type this I realize it sounds incredibly schizo so please stick with me. But this is the shit I need personal help with if anyone knows anything about it. Here's some context. My mom once talked to a past live psychic once. She was in a funk since everything to her seemed blah. Like watching the same movie 100 times. The psychic told her it was because this was her last go around for her soul. Everything felt tried and dull because she had already tried and done it all. Upon this my mom said she started crying because deep down inside she realized it was true but couldn't understand why it was true. Issue is she didn't stop there. She started talking about me and my brother. 
I think my mom mentioned us to her. She said she had a younger son, me, that will one day grow powerful and there were powerful forces pushing me to be powerful. That my older brother would help me become powerful and that was his job. This doesn't end here for me either. I went to visit a past life psychic in California in a nice hippie town in the desert. I had my past life read and these were the cards. She said I was a young soul and most of my cards were about my current life not my past one. She said the trust and faith card serving as my foundation and the angel card near the top means I have incredibly powerful forces pushing me. That I was leaving for travel very soon, I was going to a university in another country but hadn't told her, and that I had a karmic relationship. What the nature of it was she said she didn't know. Could be one where me or the other person needed to fix something. Could be we just wanted another go around together. She also said Egypt was an important place to me due to the card. At the time it wasn't. Now it is. I met an Egyptian guy who was one of my closest friends. He died and I had to ID his body. Shit turned me from a boy to a harder man in a night. Couldn't get the image of his still body for years. It's only been in the time since I met my GF that I don't see his body with every waking second. I've also had an experience with weed gummies and attempting to astral project as I was high. Felt as if there were a crowd of hands pushing me up and out of my body. My mom broke down my door because she felt something was happening to me and didn't like it. Think this one is separate but if anyone has an idea. Personally, I don't buy the chosen one bullshit or forces pushing me. I'm an atheist but I want to believe. I'm just a regular dude it feels. Aren't there more important or talented people than me? Why me? I don't know what to make of it but I do know this, if it is true. When it comes to luck I find, things nearly always work out in my favor to the point it's made me lazy. I find I simply wait for things to fall into place for me rather than actually trying and struggling. I've somewhat overcome this luckily but the luck remains the same. I've just got a depression proof job that'll pay off my six figure debt in 36 years even if I take half my salary and put it into buying the stock market. I didn't earn it or any of it. My fucking degree isn't even in the field I was hired in and all my mom tells me is to who much is given, much is required. Not gonna lie, if I have to give back for all my luck I may be fucked. What do you make of all of this Annans? Is there something that's unique and attached to my family? Is it all a LARP? Maybe this is the wrong thread for this but I really could use some advice beyond me being a schizo. I want to believe in the supernatural. But I don't believe in me being chosen or some shit. I'm just a lucky guy nothing more. Be kid. Be in a thrift store. Be bored. See a weird, old-fashioned looking box. Open the box. There is a glass object shaped very similar to a human heart inside, almost like a bottle or a bong but not symmetrical and very bumpy slash veiny surface. Instantly feel shock, horror, and sense of dread. Put the glass thing back and run away. Decides to camp outside. Sees faint light in the woods. Gets up to investigate getting closer to light and start feeling heavy notices barely visible red glow around then everything goes mute see split second flash of light back in camp laying down in bed k here's mine fair warning i was drinking when this happened but i was only about four beers deep so i doubt i was hallucinating or some shit. be me Country just recently relaxed lockdown measures. Friends immediately call me and say that everyone's going to party by the reservoir. Normally I wouldn't go to that kind of thing but I've been stuck at home for like two months so fuck it. Fast forward to Friday night, my friends and I are sitting in a semicircle on a grassy bank near the reservoir. There's like 100 people there but everyone's sort of split up into groups. Fires aren't allowed but there's a flood light nearby so everyone's visible but it's still really dark. Friends and I are all drinking and talking shit. Eventually hear bells, 
like the jingling of little bells that a fucking Christmas elf might wear on their shoes or some fanciful shit like that. Nani.jpg Turn towards sound. Girl comes walking out of the dark from the direction of a nearby field, aka, complete blackness. Nobody else was in that direction. First thing I notice is that she's really pretty, like stone cold hottie with a body. Hair is really messy and she looks like she's wearing pajamas. Looks like she just got out of bed. She asks what we're all doing there. Um, partying? Lockdown's finally finished so we're allowed out again. Oh, I was wondering where everyone had gone. Um, okay. My friend eventually asks her if she wants to sit down, she accepts. Fucking nice one. Now we got the hottest girl I've ever seen sitting next to me. We all start talking and partying again. She's actually really talkative and funny. Is this love brothers? Night continues. At a certain point I get a bit too drunk and make the worst fucking mistake of my life. Quick edit. This girl introduced herself as Marigold. Thought it was super weird but she was really hot so I just went with it, anyway. I noticed this flower growing on the bank next to where she was sitting and she said it was really pretty. I get it in my drunk head to pick it and give it to her. Real my lady, read it to your shit. I reach over her, I was on her right and the flower was on her left, and plucked the flower. As I pull back I hit her in the chin with the top of my head. WTF is wrong with me. Her hands are covering her face. I didn't know this at the time but the rest of our group had drifted off a couple of feet so we were sitting there alone. Oh shit oh shit, I'm so sorry. She's like, it's fine, I'm fine. She lowers her hands a bit, I can see like half her face. Pick related is the closest thing I can find online that resembled it. She has a porcelain doll face, not white as porcelain. It honest to God looked like it was made of porcelain. Painted like a medieval court jester with red lips and nose. Looked more comical than pick related, this was just the best I could find. Nose was longer, and the face was almost half moon shaped, had the same kind of hat though. It split down the middle and had two tendril type things with little gold bells at the tips. I'm fucking terrified at this point. She looks like she noticed and quickly covers her face again. It looks like she was pressing it into place like it was a mask but it was more like she was a doll one minute and a human the next. She looks back at me again and smiles. She's perfect again, completely beautiful and charming. I just kinda sat there for a while, dazed. She eventually gets up and tells everyone she's leaving, that's when I realize that only I saw that. My friends say goodbye and ask if she needs a lift. She says no and just walks back off into the dark. After a few seconds my female friends say it isn't safe and pressure the boys to go make sure she gets home safe. I flat out refuse but two other guys agree and go after her. They come back like 5 minutes later saying she was gone, they never saw her anywhere. Eventually I went home, still kinda shell shocked. The next day I'm talking to my mates about it. All the guys are like, yeah that girl was hot but really fucking weird. None of them say they saw anything wrong with her face. Weird part comes later. I'm talking to my one female friend about it. She had no idea what I'm talking about. I'm like, remember that girl who came out of the field? That weird fucking girl. She says no, there was a weird person who came out of the field and sat with us but it was a guy. She says it was a guy who called himself Marigold and he was the hottest guy she had ever seen. All my female friends confirm the second story. They seem to all think it was weird that we all remember a different person but only I saw the jester face. Side note, I even remember my female friends saying go make sure she gets home safe but they all tell me it was absolutely a guy and they said he, so I guess even the conversations were different depending on who heard it. Be me, 18. Camping off trail in Colorado. Bring group of friends, mostly immoral rednecks. They brought lots of weed. We bring pizza and smoke a ton, two of them pass out. Take two person shifts, pussies were worried about hunters or something. Woke me up at 2am to do my shift with other friend. 
Get up, dress properly. Notice these subhumans threw the pizza they didn't eat on the ground, outside the camp. Chad Boy Scout habits taught me better. Clean up mess for fear of approaching animals. Pointed and laughed at by friend, retard. Sit around fire, having a deep talk and relaxing. Was picking my nail or something when friend turns out to where the pizza had been. While before I noticed, but he was unmoving for several minutes. You hear a coyote or something? Is it big? Stand up to approach. See that he is not only shaking but already sweating, staring just outside the area. Looks like he's about to fucking die or something. Stare exactly where he is. Literally nothing there, no sounds or odd feelings. Thinking he's had too much weed or something. Normality continues, we come back from vacation. Straight A friend won't talk to any of us after the incident. Flunks all classes, drops out of his senior year three weeks after, cuts hair extremely short. Music taste, clothing and personality changes completely. Dumps girlfriend of two years. Haven't heard from him again. I always loved suicide alternative girls. When Life is Strange came out, I got a crush for Chloe. She became my waifu. Frequently daydream about finding one day a Chloe in my life and having a quirky and happy life together. One night I have a dream of Chloe. I dreamed that we got together and that we became a couple with fantastic chemistry. We were walking down the tracks, like in the game, when suddenly, she stops and turns smiling to me. Out of the blue, I hear a voice saying hello behind me. I turn and I see a lady in Arabian clothes riding a camel. What the fuck? She talks about how sorry she felt about the loneliness in my life and that she came to help me. As she talks Chloe walks over and stands smiling with arms crossed nearby her. She says that I will be able to find a girl like Chloe in real life to be happy with. In exchange, I only have to give her a handshake. What the fuck too? I refuse with a single no, don't know why. As I answer the lady, both her and Chloe stare me in a really stern way. And then I woke up weirded out by the dream, but without paying it too much mind. Years later, I'm playing D&D with my buddies. My friend wants to GM for the first time and I'm giving him tips as I played that role before. He explains that he wants to play a campaign based on a war of the players against the demons of Goetia. He shows me a PDF with them on and I start browsing it. Only to stop at a certain page. There is a demon in the form of a woman riding a camel called Gamori. Among her powers, there is making women fall in love. I never saw or heard anything about her before the dream. My friend said that I paled a bit while watching that picture but I told him that I just felt a little weird in the stomach. 2001. 15 years old. TN Fag. Rural AF. Hang out in the woods all the time with cousins and brother. One day I wake up and head outside as usual. It's normal here for families to own large portions of land which is divided up amongst children slash siblings. So it's almost like a humongous yard with four houses all the same family. In four in bread. So the normal thing in summer is we all kinda emerge to the yard around the same time in the morning and meet up. Anyway I see cousins and bro hanging out at picnic table. Go over and see what's up, cousin asks if I wanna go shoot BB guns in the woods. Off course. JPG. Head in the woods, shitty mossy oak pump BB guns. Always follow the creek so we don't get lost. Walk farther than usual. A lot farther. For like almost 45 minutes. Normal chit chat. Find a little waterfall. Start shooting random shit rocks, trees, specific leaves for precision tests. I'm standing at the edge of the water, shooting through the waterfall watching the ricochet get blocked by the stream. Brother walks up right behind me. It's okay Anon. Huh? He shoves me into the water. When I fall in it's like my body turns to stone. Sink to the bottom flat on my back. Creek is only like 23 feet deep but I'm flat on my back and paralyzed. 
holding my breath but I didn't have time to react so it's like half lung capacity at best. Start getting dizzy. Going black. Can't keep it up. Breath out. Breath in. Lungs fill with water. Suddenly have will again. Sit up, begin coughing and puking up creek water. After a minute I'm okay to get up, coughed all day though. Nobody was there. I couldn't have been under longer than a minute or two. Run back home crying my eyes out. Make a beeline straight to mama's lap. I mean hysterical, crying and screaming like a toddler. My brain just felt broken. It was like I was watching myself totally break down, my face buried in my mother's lap sopping wet with tears. Finally choke out what happened, mom gives me a really strange look. Bro has been home all day playing Dreamcast all day. Scariest thing that ever happened to me. Still don't understand. It's probably unrelated but the next month on the very day this happened, was 9-11. One month after that, on the 11th, my neighbor shot himself in the head with a 4 tenths shotgun, which did not kill him but obliterated his face. One month after that, he died. 2001 was a very, very strange year. I believe that chaotic energy was at a peak that year. Don't have much to contribute, but don't want to see this thread die yet. Grew up on a farm in the northern rivers of NSW. Remote? An hour and a half drive to the nearest town. We mostly had cattle and sheep. We had aboriginal workers come through once a year to help with the musters as we had a large amount of bushland, rogue bulls are a bastard to handle with just four blokes. Same workers every year on walkabout. Good blokes. Worked like absolute dogs. Actually argued down their payment with my grandfather one year, they just wanted to be able to freely pass, hunt and sleep on the property as they traveled inland. I was 15 at the time of this story. My brother was 13. Don't know how much experience you have with cattle, but especially bulls, they're built like brick shit houses. Scared of nothing. We found a rogue bulls in the bush with its head completely turned around facing the wrong way. It wasn't a fall, as the land we had was flat as a tack. It wasn't caught up in a tree, although there were plenty of them. Was just a bit of an oddity to us, but the aboriginals freaked shit. Refused to work anymore and left the next day even left the horses with us. They left on foot like they couldn't wait to get off our land. We had new aboriginal workers the next year. Still have no idea how it could have happened. Don't see many here from any English Annans. Not a inner woods but a spooky story. This shit gives me goosebumps to the day. A bit of background. Grew up on a council estate, so not a complete fag. Been in a few hairy situations, had a few fights, won some and lost some. Feel confident in myself. Just turned 18 in this story, am 32 now, and in the UK, when you turn 18 you go out in the town centre on pub crawls on Friday and Saturdays. Be me 18 ready to go out drinking with one other buddy of mine who had also recently turned 18. Let's do this dot jpg. Middle of November so bretty cold out. Our neighborhood is a mile and half away from the main strip where the pubs and clubs are, order a taxi. Buddy tells the taxi to stop just outside the town center, I'm a bit confused but he gives me a little grin and says trust me, bro. He goes off a bit down the road, stops by a bush, fucks sound a little and comes back smiling and winks. Anyway, we go into the town party and shit. Fucking smashed, dot, avi. 2.30 decide to leave the articular club we are in, call Chicago's, best to leave before they kick everyone out officially as it becomes the wild west outside. Go and get some food from the knockoff KFC to sober up a little before we head home. Buddy says fuck a taxi, and on let's walk. Fuck it let's do it. Head to where we got dropped off earlier and my buddy retrieves a case for a drill bit. 
For the non-construction fags, it's a a rectangular box made up of two middle finger length boxes that slip together. Pulls them apart and whips out a fat L plate, spliff. Now the walk home should take between 25 and 35 minutes, depending on route. We walk through this old Victorian neighborhood called Belmont. It's nice and middle class. A little bit of fog outside but comfy, street lights on nice atmospheric feeling. Especially with the weed on the go and the alcohol in the system. Anyways, once you come out of Belmont a decision is to be made for route home. There is a main road we can cross called Courthouse Road. On the other side is the gates to a park we can climb over walk through and then climb another gate to enter the neighborhood we live in. Or we can walk along the main road take a right hand turn in 5 minutes followed by a 10 minute walk and another right hand turn to the estate we live on. Fuck climbing in jeans and shit so we decide to take the long route. Now walking up the main road takes you past Street Mark's graveyard. A fucking spooky place. Never seen or heard of any happenings, just has that vibe, even though I have walked past it hundreds of times, even later than on this occasion, with nothing happening. There is a Victorian built wall about knee height along the length of Thai graveyard with a metal fence on top, you know the type of black spikes. With vines and shit creeping up the wall and twining their way around the railings. Walking past the graveyard buddy is singing a little he passes me the spliff but drops it. I pick it up and as I'm straightening from bending down I look into the graveyard and see a woman like 20 graves deep doing the exact same motion as me as if has put seeming on the grave and is standing back up. She looked tall like my height, 6'3", had a long dress on and a cardigan and looked like her hair was in a bun though hard to be sure, at that point. Fucking weird. PDF. Look at my bro and say mate look at this and turn to point into the graveyard. Fucking woman is like 10 graves closer than previously. I'm fucking weirded out but think I must be just mistaken about the distances. My mate isn't concerned just looks at me, and I at him. We both look back into the graveyard and the bitch is at the railings looking at us. She was smiling her eyes were white, completely white. Gripping the railings. We both fucking Usain bolted it back to the estate. Never been so fucking spooked in my life. I know it's not very coherent or inner woods but it happened. Gave me goosebumps even typing it out. Even when I go back to my hometown, to the day, and see my mate, he still brings it up. Fucking crazy old bitch ghosts, my dudes. Be me three years ago. Walking in woods with buddy. Usual sort of day. On a track far ahead another person is coming towards us. Weird that I didn't notice them before. Thought they were in trouble because their hands were raised in a strangler's pose. Keep looking. Feel like I'm losing my mind. My buddy is smoking weed from a can behind me and talking about UFOs. Deep sense of dread and danger. The guy ahead has a huge grin on his face. I swear for a second he starts glitching. Decide to start going a different way and stop looking in that direction. I don't even address it as I think I'm hallucinating. Buddy is still talking about UFOs, unaware. I think I may have posted before about this on this board, but being stupid, I didn't type it out first and save it. See the attached pic. About 10 to 12 years ago when I was in high school, I was seeing a girl who lived near the small strip mall and I was heading home around 10 p.m. via the bus. The red line shows the route I took from her place to the bus stop in question. While I was waiting at the bus stop, I would periodically step onto the road and look down to see if the bus was coming yet. If you Google Nestor's Market, North Van you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. Normally you can see quite a ways farther than the Google Street View does justice. At any rate, after checking a few times, I saw the headlights of the bus coming up Dollarton. As I'm watching it, I see some kind of animal poke its head out of the bushes where the blue arrow is. 
I assumed it was a raccoon or some other small critter until it stepped out into the open. The bus was still a ways away, but I could still see the silhouette of whatever came out of the trees quite clearly. It looked like an emaciated greyhound on its hind legs except the back legs had their joints reversed. It stepped out, and scampered from its side of the road to my side and disappeared into the bush on my side of the road. I was basically dumbstruck by what I saw, and didn't take my eyes of the road until the bus pulled up. The driver said he didn't see anything when I asked if he saw the animal in the road just then, and I finished my journey home without incident. I legitimately wonder if I just saw something normal and confused it for what I thought I saw until, I asked some other friends, particularly ones that worked up on Mount Seymour and they described seeing a similar creature when they would drive up or down the mountain late at night. Also note that I did not give a description of what I saw when I would ask other people, only if they had ever seen anything strange and they would give a very similar description to what I had seen. I've never spoken to anyone who's seen it do anything other than scamper about, but most people do describe that it had an almost sick feeling to it. Not necessarily that it was sick, more that it was like a symptom of something in the area being sick. Just remembered this randomly. B21 or 22 in Texas. Around 4th of July. Friends and I decide to get some fireworks. Drink and smoke a bit before leaving the city to set them off outside of town. Good 20-30 minutes outside of town now. Bunch of wilderness and farms. Driver starts going real slow to find a good spot. Decide this spot in the road is good. Haven't seen any cars in a while, no signs of anyone around at all. About to set off firework. Girls say don't do it in back of the truck. Literal pussies, but whatever. Hop out to set it on the road. Suddenly a light appears, look up, looks like someone holding a flashlight maybe 2030 feet away heading towards me. Before I can even react, driver speeds off, didn't realize I had hopped out. Turn back around, the person had easily have the distance and is heading towards me faster now. You left a non. Everyone in the back of the truck screams, he stops. Fucking run faster than I ever have in my life to the truck, jump in, driver floors it. Look back, the person is standing still where I was, turns off light. Strangest part is how we didn't see them off the side of the road before and how they didn't say a single word the entire time. Cop definitely would have identified themselves and old farmers love yelling, not to mention there were no houses in sight from where we were. I've posted this story before but fuck it ill contribute. Was camping with my cousin and uncle by the river a few kilometers out from Rand NSW, about as small a town as can still be called a town. Me and cousin, both around 10, were setting rebeat traps and trying to collect honey when we decided to explore an old quarry nearby. At the edge of the quarry was a small nearly dry creek with a tree fallen across it like in a movie, we obviously had to walk across and have an adventure. The other side of the creek was immediately different to the side we had came from, the trees were much denser and there were very few signs of humans, no tracks or roads cutting through, just bush after about a kilometer we hit a fence which we played on for a bit before turning back. This is where my memory gets fuzzy. As we started heading back I glanced behind us, out of nowhere there had appeared a pair of humanoid figures about the size of grown men, solidly built and featureless, kind of felt like they were surrounded by static or that they blended in with the trees around them. My cousin quickly noticed them too and we booked it back towards the quarry, looking back the things were steadily loping along after us like they weren't in any kind of hurry. We reached the creek and crossed without incident, and stopped on the other side, the grey things stopped and stared at us, I don't remember any features but am also confident they had eyes as weird as that sounds. After a few moments they turned back and quickly disappeared without a trace. Cousin and I went and pissed off some kangaroos and killed a snake and pretty much ignored the incident, but I haven't forgotten it nearly two decades later as the only spooky event I've ever had. This one's May, but I've never told it to anyone so fuck it. Less than 10 years old. Sitting in room talking with dad at his apartment, I'm on one side of the room he's on the other by the computer. He's playing some country song about Jesus in the background, 
Parents divorced around this time and I guess religion helped him deal with it. Here lyrics describe Jesus' cross as a tree. Say it wasn't a tree it was a cross like a smartass. Hear a scratching noise on the carpet, as if you took your fingernails and just scratched the shit out of the floor. It goes from one side of the room to the other right in front of both of us. Dad's got this holy shit grin on his face says that was wicked. Talk about it for a few minutes but once we realize we can't figure out what it was he shrugs it off and I start praying myself. Don't make smartass comments like that ever again. No idea what it was, I'm grown now and thought about looking into that apartment's history but I really don't want to know at this point. There's a couple other unrelated things that happened at my mom's place, but I can probably rationalize those away as dreaming or stress. Nonsensical and mysterious. Summer camping trip with grade 7 classmates, teachers, and chaperones. Friend 1, Garrett, no nickname yet. Friend 2 nickname, Goose, girl with a long neck. They nicknamed me Grub because I ate a maggot in grade 5. Four days to spend near a lake doing camp activities. Day 1. Campfires, cooking, watching wildlife, camp activities. Team building activities finish at about 6 p.m. and the kids disperse. Garrett, Goose, and me skip rocks at the big lake. We look out at the small tree-covered and seemingly uninhabited island in the middle of the lake. We talk about what could be there. Garrett suggests secretly jumping into the lake, which is off limits until day two. Goose refuses because her mother is back at the camp as a chaperone. Tell Garrett that I wouldn't go either because Goose's mother knows my parents. Garrett takes his shirt off. Goose and me try to discourage him by talking about a Loch Ness monster lurking in the depths. Tell him it's getting too dark to swim but he insists. Garrett puts his camera in my waterproof backpack, puts it on, and jumps in telling us that he'll take plenty of pictures when he gets to the island. Island is at least 150 meters away. We watch him slowly make his way. He gets to the island and waves back to us before walking off into the dark and disappearing into the trees with his flashlight on. About 45 minutes later it's gotten dark and no sign of him. Goose doesn't have a phone, and Garrett took my backpack that has my phone inside. We decide to head back to the campsite to make it in time for attendance as to not raise suspicion. I'm able to get away with pretending to be Garrett for roll call by raising my hand with my hood up. Everyone settles down to tell stories and prepare to sleep. Goose and me take our food and sleeping bags and hurry back to the lake. Still no signs of Garrett. We kept watch for hours and may or may not have seen what looked like his flashlight blinking on maybe two occasions in the darkness of the brushes and trees. Eventually we both fall asleep. Day 2. Wake up to no signs on Garrett. I still impersonate Garrett for roll calls. It's now swimming day so now everyone is swimming and playing by the lake. Goose and me worried about Garrett and how awkward it would be for him to swim back with everyone out by the shore. Garrett still doesn't come back. Roll call and then everyone makes their way back to the campsite together. Goose and me stay behind and watch the island until we fall asleep. Day 3. Fast forward the routine. Fall asleep in the rain that night by the lake again without a sign of Garrett. Day 4. Everyone's packed and ready to go home. Goose and me skip camp activities to keep an eye on the lake. Getting dangerously close to the end of the trip. I decide I need to swim out. While I'm preparing to swim and laying out a game plan with Goose, she gets excited and starts jumping around crying and pointing at the lake. It's Garrett making his way back. We both hug him. Think he was just playing a bad prank on us while we were worried and stressed out. Headbutt him at a bad angle and his tooth get knocked out. This is how Garrett got his own nickname from then on, Gappy. He's apologizing and he's just as confused as we are. He still thinks it's day two. We explain that it's the final hours of day four and that he's been gone for three nights. He shares his story. He gets to the island waves back to us and takes our picture from the island before going off to explore. Mostly appeared to be nothing but trees and wild growth. 
As he explores he finds a broken old rowboat, burnt firewood, and other signs of an abandoned campsite. Trips and twists his ankle. He knows he won't be able to swim back in the dark with his injury so he crawls around to start make bedding for himself out of big leaves. Blacks out while crawling around and collecting leaves. Dreams he is sitting by the same campsite. The rowboat is no longer broken and the campfire is lit. A tattered old fisherman in rubber boots approaches the fire from behind a tree. Fisherman has frightening appearance and shadowed eyes that can't be made out. Fisherman points at his ankle and mumbles the an unintelligible question three times. Fisherman starts approaching with one hand reaching into his coat pocket. Garrett panics but can't move. Fisherman brings the hand out from his pocket and is holding a small dull ball of light that grows as it floats towards Garrett. Garrett wakes up cold and damp, from rainfall on day three, and is leaning against the broken old rowboat near the abandoned firewood. The leaves that he was collecting are gone. He stands up and is prepared to limp but has no pain in his twisted ankle, which still looks badly swollen. He rushes back to us thinking that it's only been a single night, not knowing that it's been three. He wasn't hungry or thirsty when he got back after three nights. He recalls taking great photos and even using some flash photography on day one. Most of the photos he took side from the first one of Goose and me from across the lake looked like nonsense. Blurry, or dark and impossible to make out, or completely whited out, 